City's COVID outbreak has surged overnight. According to the Premier, we're in an absolutely critical phase. The risk is everywhere. For the first time, we've hit 112 cases in a single day. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And with Sydney notching a record number of COVID cases today, it's clear the city's lockdown is set to last some time. Which means you can expect more protestations from the folks at Sky After Dark, who spent last week ridiculing the New South Wales government and lashing the lockdown. And as so often, it was Alan Jones leading the charge. Suspend all political salaries until the lockdown ends. And for New South Wales people, let me repeat, while we have to suffer this idiocy, inaccuracy, dishonesty, unscientific pronouncements every day, Gladys Berejiklian forfeits the right to lead and to run the state. We still are in the middle of what I sadly like to call COVID theatre. This is where you've got to keep people scared. Frankly, I feel trapped in Groundhog Day. Once again, dramatic lockdown, scary talk threats. Stay home or else. And joining the pylon, which looks remarkably out of place tonight, was 2GB's Ben Fordham. The virus hasn't killed anyone in Australia this year. But the lockdowns, the extensions, the excuses, the mistakes, the missed opportunities, they are killing this city fast. And stop telling us it's about the health advice. Well, lockdowns certainly are brutal for business and livelihoods. But the health advice is that Australia would be mad to abandon them until most of us are vaccinated. And with Australia shamed around the world for its bungled vaccine rollout, the PM was in desperate need of a miracle when this story magically landed on the front page of The Australian on Friday. PM opens the Pfizer floodgates. That exclusive story trumpeted what The Australian described as a potentially game-changing deal to triple Australia's access to the Pfizer vaccine. And not surprisingly, the breakfast TV shows were soon welcoming the news. Well, still to come, a flood of Pfizer, a massive boost for the vaccine rollout. Our supply of the jab tripled within days. Pfizer floodgates open, one million doses arriving down under every week. And so good was the news that the PM paid Sunrise and today a visit to spruik the deal. We've gone from 1.7 million in June, 2.8 million this month, and we'll rise to a million a week from the 19th of July. We'll get up to a million doses a week from the 19th of July. Scott Morrison also phoned into ABC's AM program, whose host, Sabra Lane, tweeted the glad tidings ahead of their chat. The federal government has secured an extra one million doses of Pfizer vaccine a week from July 19. And at the top of AM, Sabra Lane was telling listeners... The federal government's announced this morning a major increase to Australia's troubled COVID vaccination program. It's secured extra Pfizer doses. But soon, journalists are pointing out that there's no extra vaccine on the horizon, including ABC News Online. Australia isn't getting more Pfizer vaccine doses than planned. And Pfizer then issued a statement to confirm. The total number of 40 million doses we are contracted to deliver to Australia over 2021 has not changed. But tripling supply to one million doses a week is surely good news, isn't it? Well, yes, except it's not actually news. Here is Health Minister Greg Hunt telling reporters nine days ago about the schedule for the four weeks in July. How many doses of Pfizer were expecting and when? Sure. Uh, so this month we will have 2.8 million doses of Pfizer. It starts at uh, uh, 300, 500, a million and a million over the course, so we'll build up. A fact that was noted on ABC Insiders next day with a slightly different spin. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wait to the second half of July for the real ramp up. So, going back to that front page exclusive in last Friday's The Australian, spruiking the government's... Potentially game-changing deal to triple its access to Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines to one million doses a week from July 19. That news was not exclusive and wasn't even new. And the breakfast shows who talked it up were also conned by the PM's media spin. Although, when asked about it at Friday's press conference, the PM disclaimed any responsibility. I, I never so, said there are additional doses so this year. Yeah, 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 bring forward doses. So, was there anything new for Australians in the PM's promise? Well, yes, and a bouquet to Sky News political reporter Trudy McIntosh for reading the fine print and figuring out... What's new in what the Prime Minister is announcing today is, in fact, the confirmation about what's going to be arriving in August. And what exactly is that? Crucially, look at the number for August. They are now saying we will be receiving 4.5 million doses. So really, we're getting to bring forward 1.5 million doses in that month. 
There was a lot of talk about whether this is a flood of vaccines into the country. Well, that flood looks like it's really going to be more like in September. So, no extra vaccines and no faster rollout this month. And not quite the game-changing message the PM and some of the media were pitching on Friday. As long-time commentator Michelle Grattan observed on Twitter... The lesson the spinners never learn. If you put out info in a straightforward, direct form, with someone credible to properly explain, instead of leaking for a headline and glossing the whole thing, you have a lot less cleaning up in the kitchen the next day. But now, let's leave the pandemic and go to the Great Barrier Reef and to UNESCO's imminent threat to put Australia's biggest tourist attraction on the endangered list, as foreshadowed in the media last month. UNESCO wants to list the World Heritage Site as in danger. This is outlined in a draft decision released today. It points the finger at global warming, but also the government's inaction on climate change. This decision is strongly based in science and reflects the poor health of the reef. The Australian government's reaction to that UNESCO warning, which could see the reef's World Heritage status downgraded next week, was angry and immediate with claims that Australia had been blindsided and that China, which chairs the UNESCO committee, was out to get us. This is a complete subversion of normal process. The Foreign Minister and I had a late night meeting with the Director General of UNESCO last night and we made very clear our strong disappointment, uh, even our bewilderment, that our officials have been blindsided in the way that they have. Environment Minister Susan Lee's complaint was backed by urgent government briefings behind the scenes. And as a result, just about every media organisation chose that angle as the story. Government blindsided. 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 But the screams of unfair play were echoed loudest by News Corp, with the Australian's headline branding UNESCO's draft decision an ambush and its story parroting the government's line. Australia has been blindsided by a push by a China-chaired UN committee to declare the Great Barrier Reef in danger without proper consultation or scientific process. Next day, the Oz doubled down with another front-page story. And other News Corp mastheads like The Daily Telegraph and The Courier Mail joined the chorus of complaint. Whereupon the hosts at Sky News, like Paul Murray, Chris Kenny, and an incredulous Andrew Bolt, took up the tune. Now, global warming, it's not simply grotesquely exaggerated. It's also a con, very cleverly played by China. But now it seems that China's worked out another way to exploit this warming scare. It seems to punish Australia for shutting up and not, or not shutting up and not kowtowing. Also crying foul on Sky was Tony Abbott's former Chief of Staff, Peter Credlin, repeating the claim there had been no process and no warning. This has come out of the blue, so spell it out for my leaders, uh, viewers at home. What's happened? That's exactly right, Peter. Uh, UNESCO hasn't visited the Great Barrier Reef since 2012, but all of a sudden, with no proper process, no proper warning, and I think not coincidentally, under a chair from China, who is a minister in the Chinese government, uh, we have been warned that we're likely to be put back on the list again. But was UNESCO's warning really unfair and unforeseen? And was that the most important story? Because, in fact, it had not come out of the blue at all, as even the Australian acknowledged in its editorial. As Michael Slezak explained in a package for ABC News... The World Heritage Committee raised its concerns in 2015 when it warned the government that any plan to save the reef had to address climate change. The ultimate measure of success will be that the current documented declines in the property have halted and are reversing. The reef escaped back then after fierce resistance from the Abbott government and it escaped another UNESCO warning in 2017. And on ABC 7.30 three weeks ago, UNESCO's Dr Fanny Duvray was adamant that the listing is all about the science. This draft decision is a technical, objective evaluation of the state of the reef. It's based on the best available science. That science has been very clear for many years, um, just with three consecutive bleachings in less than five years, water quality targets that have not been met is just simply irrevocably clear. Meanwhile, the world's coral experts here and overseas agree the risk is real. And indeed, they have been sounding the alarm for years. Yet, for the last three weeks, News Corp columnists have relentlessly pushed the government line and typically ignored the plight of the reef or denied it. On the Bolt Report on Sky, for example, and in The Australian, News Corp's coral contrarian Dr Peter Ridd assured us the reef is fine and its real problem is... Wait for it. 
Australian reef science and reef management organisations. They have been claiming for decades that the reef is endangered based on shoddy research. They loaded the gun and pointed it at Australia. The Chinese government merely said, thank you, and pulled the trigger. On Sky, another favourite climate sceptic, Jennifer Marahasi, assured Chris Kenny that Peter Reid is right. And on Sky's Outsiders, Queensland coal industry champion Senator Matt Canavan also blamed Australia's boffins, telling Rita Panahi, Rowan Dean and James Morrow, re-UNESCO... Guess what? They don't quote the Chinese Communist Party, they don't quote the Belt and Road Initiative, they quote Australian government reports that say the reef is terrible and in very poor condition. We've created a rod for our own back. And yes, he said, the reef is fine. Now, you may think it's bizarre that such a serious threat to one of the wonders of the world, which brings in billions of dollars and thousands of jobs for Australia, should be blamed on the incompetence of our scientists or on political games played by China. But on Sky After Dark's opinion shows, that's exactly what's happened. It is depressing, but predictable. However, we doubt it will change UNESCO's decision, which is expected to come next week. But now to Sydney's radio ratings and bad news for the man who replaced Alan Jones. A big upset in today's radio ratings with 2GB losing the number one spot in breakfast for the first time in 17 years. 2GB's breakfast host is Ben Fordham and on 7 Sunrise his toppling was also hot news. 2GB has been sensationally dethroned. One year after the departure of Alan Jones, it's been knocked off top spot in Sydney's breakfast radio ratings by this pair. 2GB has won the lucrative breakfast slot for almost two decades, mainly thanks to Alan Jones, who topped an incredible and unbeaten 226 ratings surveys. So how did Kyle and Jackie O usurp the crown? FM's Bad Boy of Radio says their success is partly to do with COVID fatigue and that listeners are... Tired of COVID chat because it's the same information that's just been recycled 24 hours a day. It very rarely changes. But it's not just that. As anyone who listens to the show would know, Kyle and his partner have a, a certain style. We're not woke. We're, we're, we're asleep when it comes to being woke because wokeness is so boring. Which is code for saying they dare to go where others do not, with nudity, crass commentary and tasteless stunts like this shocker in May. I'll take a look at my enormous penis. Kyle and Jackie O's most beautiful penis pageant. Yes, two months ago, Kyle and Jackie O ran a cock competition. And for a whole week, they prodded and probed a handful of courageous callers. Tell us a little about your penis. I'm circumcised. Uh, it's got a... Oh, slight, slight bend in it. Got, got some veins in it. The head is really big, so it really looks like a mushroom, uh, like a really nice mushroom. And how exactly did the in-studio penis pageant work? Well, as Jackie O explained... We had to rate them out of five when it came to girth, length, um, the aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, what else was there? Pubic the hair pubic region. Hair, yeah, yeah. Whether you would clone it, its head shape. And yes, like all competitions, someone had to come out on top. Contestant number five, Sam. Yes, Sam, well done. Wrap that thing around your uh, top there. Oh, you got to put the crown on it. Sam was rewarded with $1,000, a crown and a sash. And Kyle and Jackie O were rewarded with their ratings victory, which just goes to show when others go low, you can always go lower. And finally, among all the gloomy COVID stories, the media last week found something a little bit sweeter. And we now have the perfect reason to indulge because it is World Chocolate Day. Local celebrated World Chocolate Day in decadence, one company leaving goodies in Lambton letter boxes. Yes, it was World Chocolate Day. Whoever knew that was a thing? And who on earth could have invented it? Ah, yes, the chocolate manufacturers. Sweet treats taken to the city's streets. A glass and a half hand delivered to select suburbs across the country. What do you say? Say what do you say? Thank you. Happy World Chocolate Day. <laughs> yes, create a Covid safe stunt of chocolate in letterboxes and TV will eat it up. And believe it or not, it even turned up on Eddie's game show. Which of these is not a regular flavour in Cadbury's snack chocolate block? A pineapple, B caramel, C strawberry, D peppermint. But it wasn't just Cadbury squeezing plugs from this bogus media event. Tonight, inside chocolate heaven. This was an assignment I had to accept. 
We're inside Nestle's chocolate factory, where the corner of Wonka Way and Kit Kat Boulevard are bustling. That is Alexis Daish, Nine's former US correspondent, reporting from a new front line. And in South Australia, another prominent plug. It's World Chocolate Day. Even the Premier Stephen Marshall has been getting involved. I've been sent a special limited edition Neapolitan wafer from Hague. So thank you very much, Hague's. Free stuff, more plugs. And finally, a pun to beat them all. It also marks the day that an Egyptian mummy was discovered covered in nuts and chocolate. It was Pharaoh Rocher. Oh, that's very good. And uh, before we go, we need to correct the record. Last week, we hoed into the ABC and West Australian for stories linking the death of a Perth woman who did not have a blood clot to the AstraZeneca vaccine. The TGA is still investigating, but now believes the woman's death was likely linked to the vaccine due to a very rare blood disorder which can cause excessive bleeding. Our apologies to the ABC and West Australian and our sympathies to the family. That's all from us tonight. It's more on our website where you can stream or download the program. And don't forget, Media Bites every Thursday online. But for now until next week, goodbye.